Hi, my name is John, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Puget Sound Foursquare Church, and I just want to say, welcome. Welcome home. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that this service encourages and blesses you today. Before we get started, I want to remind you that we're back at the church having service outside, but it doesn't stop us from interacting with you right here on our online campus. We have a lot of content ahead for you, so make sure you stay tuned. As we get started today, Pastor Laura and the Sound Worship Team will be leading us in the song. Would you pray with me as we get started? Holy Spirit, we invite you into our hearts. We invite you into our homes. God, we are, we are so honored to be able to worship you today. Holy Spirit, I just pray during this time, God, that we would be able to lift our hands, lift our hearts, God, lift our voices to you. Lord, be with Pastor Laura and the worship team as they lead us in a song. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, we just thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus, that you came, that heaven came down to earth just attention on you this morning. You are the hope, you are the light in the darkness, and we choose to worship you this morning. God, if there's any place in our heart this morning that is not fully surrendered to you, we just surrender it to you right now. We ask you to come and fill this place like that song was just saying. Fill the place of our hearts, Jesus. Fill every place of our heart. Remove those things. They're causing a shadow over you. God, we want to see you clearly. We want to see you face to face. We want to be in your presence. We want you to be honored and glorified with worship and with praise. Help us, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry 
When I've come with fire tender, I'm sorry. When I forget that you're enough, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment, I never wanna be. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. say thank you to our worship team. I love that we're able to worship together even online. What else has been a song that has been ministering to you? Let us know down below. We want to listen with you. Hey, if worship encouraged you at all, would you do me a favor and like the post and would you share the service to your timeline as well? Lately, we've been able to reach more people than we ever have digitally and it's all because of you. If you're new, or for those of you who are checking out our page and our social media, are you following us? What are you waiting for? Make sure you guys click 
that follow like button and stay connected with everything that is happening here at Puget Sound Foursquare Church. So what is happening here at Puget Sound Foursquare Church? I'm glad you asked because we have a few announcements. We have three, everyone say three, three specific announcements. One, face covering for kids. For the fall, we wanna provide fun themed face coverings for students. We have set a personal church goal to make and give away 300 face coverings. Will you help us reach that goal? Our second announcement is the Summer 2020 Youth Digital Experience. We believe camp has the ability to change lives. As such, we're bringing the camp experience indoors. Join us for a free Foursquare Next Gen Digital Camp Experience this coming Friday and Saturday, July 24th and 25th, starting at 11 a.m. on Friday. As the youth pastor, I wanna personally invite you. So if you're between sixth and 12th grade, I hope you will come and join me. Our last announcement is our Give Help Find Help program. We're still providing food relief kits, so if you or a neighbor needs them, please let us know. You can find all the information for all of this on our website, social media, or through the Church Center app. Speaking of the Church Center app, do you know what else you can do there? That's right, you can give your tithes and offerings. Giving is a staple within our faith, not because we're forced to give, but because we know that as we've been given much, we give much as well. So church, how has your surrender been lately? How has your yes and amen been lately? Have you been flexing your trust muscles during this season? You can give online on the Church Center app like we talked about, or you can mail your checks into the church. The address will be down below. Before we go anywhere else, here's Pastor Heather with our Kids Corner. Hi kids, Pastor Heather here. Welcome to Kids Corner. Hey parents, did you know that every week I send out a newsletter that contains all of the links to the curriculum and it contains videos of our teachers teaching the lesson so that you don't have to. If you are not on this list right now, why don't you send me an email, heather at Puget Sound Foursquare, and I will add you to the list. Kids, did you get a chance to watch last week's video about creation? If you didn't, just ask your parents to access that letter, click on the link, and you can watch the video. This week's video is called The Terrible Lie, and it is all about how Satan tricked Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. See, Satan knew that as people, we would always want more. More ice cream, more candy, and more toys, right? He knew that Adam and Eve would want more than what God had already given them. He lied and he told them that if they ate from that apple, they would have more knowledge than even God. And they ate the apple, and that's not what happened to them. See, kids, Satan likes to trick us even today. He always wants us thinking about the future, about what maybe we'll have then, rather than just being happy with what God has given us right now, today. Wouldn't it be terrible, kids, if we were always thinking about what else we wanted, rather than just choosing to be really happy with what we have? See, Satan just wants to continue to trick us, but we don't have to let him. Kids, can you think right now about something that you are really grateful for? Now run over and tell somebody, and then take a minute to thank God for giving you that thing. All right, kids, until next week, have a fantastic Sunday. I miss you a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, church, now's the time. Bundle up, get comfy, get cozy, turn your volume up real, real loud, grab a cup of coffee and whatever you need as our lead pastor, Pastor Lance Powers, delivers the word of God today. If you're excited, give me an AMEN in all caps. Did you guys respond? Are you guys ready? All right, without further ado, here's Pastor Lance. Hey there, church. Good to see you. Pastor Lance here. Uh, hey, super excited to welcome you to church this morning. And I want to make a special welcome to those of you who are on Fox Island 
Uh, those will, many of you don't know this, but we're getting ready to launch a Fox Island campus sometime this fall. So all of you who are watching in part of our church at a bit of a distance, we love you and it's good to have you with us this morning. I'm glad. Hey, this uh, morning, I want you to know we are in week two of a series entitled For the Win. Uh, we've been talking about what it means to uh, walk as one of David's mighty men did in the Bible. Uh, you know, before we uh, get started, I want to share with you a little about something that God's put on my heart. I know this is uh, just for me. I think it's something that he wants me to share with you as a church. I feel like it's a prophetic word for us. And, and I would just tell you this. Here's the word I believe God has for us as a church. The Lord would have you know he's not surprised by any of this. God is not surprised by anything. He's not surprised by anything. God's not surprised by the, the, the COVID-19 issue, the, the racial problems. He's not surprised by the economic craziness or the political craziness. God's not surprised by anything. I just want you to know, here's the great news. God is in control in the midst of all of the craziness. I want you to know that God is so good. So as I've been praying about this, I've been asking the Lord, what do you want to say to your church in the middle of this whole thing? And what do you want to say today specifically? And here's what it put on my heart. He said, I wanted to want the church to know that I'm preparing them for something great. That God is in the process of preparing us for something great. He's pre preparing us. Listen, God has always prepared his church for something. Every time there's been a, an amazing move of God, every time there's been an amazing outpouring, he's always prepared his church in advance. God has always done that. Remember when Moses uh, moved the children of Israel out of slavery into bondage? God took 40 years to prepare a man, to prepare to lead him, and then he warned him and said, hey, listen, there's going to, and remember all the plagues that happened, God prepared his church and his people to move. I want you to know God is in the process of preparing us. My question for you, though, this morning is this. Are you, are you aware of the fact that he's preparing you, or are you finding yourself complaining about the fact that it's uncomfortable? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this. I wonder sometimes if in the preparation process that God is actually in the process of creating capacity for us. Uh, here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced in our own strength we don't have the capacity in and of our own ability to do what it is that God wants to do in and through us. We don't have the capacity on our own. I believe that God wants to give us and challenge us and use us more than we could ever ask or imagine. Part of that using us means that we need to have a capacity in our chest uh, for more. Uh, let me explain. It, the book of Job in the Old Testament it was an interesting book, right? Uh, let me just read a passage out of the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this, the book of Job. Some of you are aware of the book of Job. Some of you just think that uh, your Bible has the book in it called Job. All right, The book of Job, let me read this to you. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, There was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was, get this, blameless. He was a man of complete integrity, and he feared God and stayed away from evil. Could there have been a better thing to be said about you than those things? Right? Hmm. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep. He owned 3,000 camels. He owned 500 teams of oxen and 500 female donkeys, and he employed many servants. He was, in fact, get this, the richest person in that entire area. That was who Job was. God said he loved Job. Job was amazing. Now, let me, let me, let me go to the last chapter of this book of Job. Right? Chapter 1 said that things about Job. It said that he was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Here's what it says in Job chapter 42. This is the last chapter in that same book. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than he had at the beginning of his life. Listen to this. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 team of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and he also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Get this. He literally had twice as much than he began with. Interesting. So maybe you're not familiar with Job. Maybe you're not familiar with his life at all. And you hear these two passages of Scripture, one from the beginning of his life and one from the end of his life. And you know that at one point he was following God. He walked with integrity. He did everything right. 
and God was blessing him. But then it was, it was as if at the end of his life, God gave him twice as much as he had before. Right? Now, without reading the book of Job, you might think to himself, like, well, of course, God loved him. God, God had all this wonderful stuff for him, and then he gave him more because he just loved him. Well, I know that some of you are smirking because you know what the story of the book of Job is about a man who had to go through lots of trial, lots of suffering, lots of pain, right? Here's my opinion. Everyone say Lance's opinion, all right? This is Lance's opinion on this. I think, honestly, if I could really go back into that moment, it's almost as if God said, I love my servant Job so much. I wish, this again, this is my opinion, I wish I could bless him with Oh gosh, more than, I, more than he has now. In fact, I would love to give him twice as much as he ever had. And right about then, a knock on the door. And it was the enemy. And he came up and said, you know what? Well, you keep on, you, he's, you, you love Job and he loves you so much because you keep blessing him. How about you let me just, you know, rain all, all mean and bad things down upon him. All kinds of trials. Let me do that and he'll stop loving you, God. Get this. I think God said this. Oh, I'll use you, devil, To create, listen to this, capacity in my servant Job so that he will be able to have twice as much blessing. Huh. You see, what I think, honestly, is that this whole trial we're going through today, with all that's going on, is God preparing us for something. God preparing us for something far greater than we ever knew. I think it's far more a preparation process than it is a judgmental process. Now, I think there's judgment needed in our, in our country for sure. And I think there's lots that need to be corrected. And I think that's true. And I think God can correct and judge and do all the things that he does just well. But I got a funny feeling that God so loved the world. Here's my fear. My fear is that Christians today are fighting the wrong battle. But we're fighting the wrong battle. We spent so much time, we're spending so much of our time trying to fight the government, trying to fight the, uh, the, the internet, trying to fight the, you name it. You know, I don't have to define your fights. You know that it's all out there. It's as if we're trying to say, this person won't allow me to do this, this person won't allow me to do that, and oh boy, oh boy, and we're pointing and fighting. Here, let me tell you this, church. I think God's preparing us, and we're fighting the wrong battle. It's as if we're sitting on the the promenade deck of the Titanic, mad that our pillow cushions aren't fluffed up enough. And, we, enough. and, and, and somehow we're getting mad that our, our pillows are flat instead of fluffy, and we've forgotten the fact that we just hit an iceberg and the, the, the Titanic's sinking, and there are people going to hell. I think the problem is, is that we have our focus off and we're fighting the wrong battle. I feel like God is saying, would you just start fighting the right battle? Just allow me to create capacity in you so that you can do the thing that's most important to me. You know what's most dear to God's heart? The lost. The lost. Remember, you know how much God loves the lost? He loves the lost so much that he sent his son to die for them. Well, us. God so loved the world. Listen, if you want to fall in love with God, fall in love with that which is important to him. Somebody says to me, if I want to fall in love with God, I need to spend more time doing churchy things. Can I tell you, churchy things are awesome. But if you really want to fall in love with him, fall in love with that which is closest to his heart. That's which would motivate him to give his son to the lost. Hmm. Okay. Let's go back to our study. I love this. God's good, man. I'm telling you, he's got a word for us today. Right? He wants to prepare the church. He wants to create capacity in us because there's something he wants to do for us and through us and in us and in spite of us. He wants to do something, right? There's times when I just think like, God, it would be far easier if you just did it without us. But he doesn't want to. God wants to cooperate with you and I, right? Here we go. Last week, we talked about one of David's mighty men. We've been talking about that out of 2 Samuel and Chronicles. Uh, the mighty men of David, right? We, we bumped into a first one. His name was... Uh, Joshua Beam. Remember Joshua Beam? Uh, he, the Bible said he had a nickname, and his nickname was uh, Adino the Esnite, which translates, flexible as a worm, strong as a tree. Last week we spent some time saying we needed to learn how to be more flexible, and we need to learn how to be more strong, right? So how do we become flexible and strong? We allow ourselves to be stretched, and we start lifting stuff that's heavier than we're used to, right? Stretched and, and, stretched and, and lifting stuff. It's exactly where God has us today. Well, well this week, I want to talk to you about another one of David's mighty men, Eleazar. Now, to be honest with you, I don't know if it's possible, uh, but, but I think he's my favorite so far. I think, well, it's only two, so, but he's one of my favorites. In fact, I would be so bold as to say I think he's the best, the favoritest one to me. How about that for good grammar? 
Here we go. Let me tell you four things quickly about Eleazar that we read in the Bible. He's a guy, listen to this, you think you'll like him too. He's a guy who stood strong in the face of adversity. He's a man who continued to fight when everyone else ran away. Listen to this. Eleazar held on tight to the truth. Listen to this. He also walked humbly when the battle was over. Hmm. Open your Bibles, if you could, to 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. It says this. Next in rank among the three were Eleazar, the son of Dodai, the descendant of Ahoah. Once Eleazar and David stood together against the Philistines when the entire Israelite army fled. He killed Philistines, get this, until his hand was too tired to lift his sword. And the Lord gave him a great victory that day. The rest of the army did not return until it was time to collect the plunder. Hmm. Now let's flip over, if you could, to 1 Chronicles chapter 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 11. These are the only two places that really speak about Eleazar. But it's almost exactly the same thing. This particular passage was written 150 years after the first one. And it says this. And next in rank, among the three, Eleazar, son of Dodai, the descendant of Ahoah, he was with David in the battle against the Philistines at Pas Damin. The battle took place in, the field of, in a field full of barley. The Israelite army fled, but Eleazar and David held their ground in the middle of the field and beat back the Philistines. So the Lord saved them by giving them a great victory. Okay, there's a couple things we know. Let's unpack this a little bit. Eleazar was a great dude, the great dude who stood strong in the face of adversity. But let's take a couple of things out of here. It says here that Eleazar and David stood against the Philistines. We know that the battle took place in a field of barley. We know that the battle took place at a city called Pas Damin. We know that he fought long and hard, so much so that he couldn't open his hand and he was completely exhausted. We know that uh, his pals came eventually at the end of the battle to pick up all the plunder. <laughs> That's what we know about this guy, right? We know just a few things about him, but let's unpack a little bit. I think these things that we know about Eleazar, in my opinion, these are things that, quite frankly, are what God is bringing some of us through to prepare us and create capacity for what God has us going through today. Let me explain. Let me talk to you today about how God, how God creates capacity. Number one. To create capacity, the first thing we need to do is never fight alone. Never stand alone. I love this. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. Right? In other words, two standing back to back can conquer because they don't have to worry about their, their, somebody attacking them from behind because they stand back to back and they fight that way. Right? I love this. Eleazar and David literally fought the enemy. Now, Remember we talked about this last week when these guys, they, uh, the Philistines had a bit of a code of ethic when it came to fighting and they didn't fight by big jumping on people and there was like a, a herd of people. They literally fought, they believed in an ethics of battle which was one man fights one man. So, so as David and Eleazar fought this way, they, they, they protected each other's backside, one man fighting another man fighting another man. They, uh, that somehow the Philistines believed that the, the honor code couldn't be broken and that's why one man could kill a bunch of people at a time, because it was one man after one man after one man. Here we go. I love this. They stood together. Can I tell you this? If there's one thing that's dying in our world today is loyalty. Loyalty. I love the fact that Eleazar was loyal to David. Right? It's hard to foster in a relationship today, especially in our the, the social distancing kind of world. How do you foster building a relationship? Can I tell you how important it is for you to have someone in your life that's loyal to you. Someone into your life that you will fight for and who will fight for you. I think we need someone in our life who will tell us the truth as well. Someone who, who might even jump up against you and say, you're wrong. Your boss is not that crazy. Or you're, you're, I'm telling you what, you're, you're not the, you don't have all the answers, my friend. I mean, what, there, there might be somebody that says, hey, look, your wife, she's not wrong in this. And, and a good friend, right? A good friend will bring about that kind of truth. I think sometimes we're always looking for someone to, uh, to like us. <laughs> we do that online, right? We're just looking for somebody to give us a like. Can, can I just tell you, it's okay to find a friend who doesn't like everything that you do, but who will remain loyal to you in battle. Well, what a, what a, what a trait that seems to be missing today. Loyalty. Loyalty. There's a show that uh, uh, my assistant Heather, Pastor Heather, asked me the other day uh, if I would watch it. It's called Alone. Some of you have seen it. I mean... 
anyway, I'm in, I'm in this one episode. Uh, it's, uh, there's a bunch of episodes, but in this one season, I think I'm in episode six or seven. Here's what I'm finding so far uh, in this, this show alone, is that the, when they first get to this, this place that, they're, that these guys are in this survival mode, and they're, they're, there's ten people set to survive over this long period of time, and they're given a small group of, or a small uh, uh, cache of things they can use to survive, and the last one standing basically wins. And so, uh, it, at first, the thing they do is they, they start out with shelter. I gotta get shelter, I gotta get dry and stay warm, and then they're like, I'm hungry. So then they get, then, then their shelter becomes less of a tarp and, and it starts to turn into walls. And then they start looking for animals instead of like berries. And next thing you know, they go back to the, they show the camera and it shows back to their shelter and it's got walls with insulation because it's more permanent. It's so amazing to me that like uh, the, the thing that, that in, and now in season, uh, the, the episode six that I'm at, and it's close to the end, is I'm finding that they have, one guy had food and shelter and all the things he needed to survive. But you know what he didn't have? companionship. He didn't have a friend. He didn't have somebody who could talk with him. He just had a lens of a camera. And I'm just saying, I'm telling you, loyalty and a friendship is far greater than having all the things on the planet. And, and people just like us because we say quippy things and delete it so no one else, uh, come on. We need somebody in our life who can tell us the truth. Number two, how does God create capacity in us? Number two, we need to remember battles that were won. Remember battles that were won. It says that he was at a place called Paz Damen. Can I tell you this? It's interesting. If I went to look back at this and what this, where this place was in the Bible. So this is David. It says that David went to meet with the Philistines at a place called Paz Damen. D-A-M-M-I-M. It literally means this. It's the same place, listen to this, where David fought Goliath. Right? It says that David fought Goliath in the Valley of Elam, or Elah. It's the same place. Hmm. Eleazar and David stood together. They stood together facing, facing an old battle. I think they faced an old battle. In my opinion, it says that David went and picked the fight. It said that David, actually some of your Bibles, if it's a newer translation, it doesn't say it well and it kind of disappoints me. But it actually says in some older translation, ASV, King James, newest, New King James, uh, New American Standard, it says things like this. It says that David and Eliezer went and taunted the Philistines, right? And it's kind of a weird thing because you think like, why would you be taunting the Philistines? Uh, here's what I, I don't think he was sitting there saying neener, neener, neener. I think literally David got to the point where he was, he was saying this to the Philistine army. You don't own me anymore. And, and I think he needed to remind the enemy that this was the place that David slew the giant. This was the place that David cut off the head of Goliath. And I feel like David was having this inner turmoil and he grabs a friend and says, come on. And, and the whole army comes charging forward. And then the next thing you know, the army bails out. The only two that are left are Eleazar and David. And David's fighting a battle that he had already won. I feel like some of us have, have, have forgotten the fact that there's already battles that have been won and we're letting those giants come back to life. Those battles of insecurity, those battles of fear, those battles of shame, those battles that I'm not enough, the battles that, you know those familiar voices that come back again and again. It's interesting too, it says that they stood in a, a, a field of, of, of barley. Barley, 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 barley. It, why barley? Why is there something about that? I'm going to tell you this. Again, did a little research on this too. Uh, you know why they stood in the field of barley? Because barley was what horses ate. Barley was food that horses and uh, the, the poor ate. So here's what was really happening. David was saying this, this old battle ain't going to have me anymore. I will have this battle. And David stood up and he said, listen, not only that, I will, I, I will remove your ability to move forward and advance into my world anymore by taking your horses out of the fight. I just have this challenge to you today, church. When will we stand up and fight a battle that's already been won and begin to stand on the truth that we've already done and say, listen, that battle's already been fought. I don't need to go back and revisit it again. And, and to, make, to make sure that it's known, we have someone who's fighting with us and says, listen, and I'll remove all of your battle plans. And you won't have the strategy to take me now. Hmm. Number three. How, do want God want to create, want, how does God want to create capacity in us? Number three. He wants to create capacity because we empty ourselves. 2 Samuel 23 says, But Eleazar stood his ground, stuck to the, struck down the Philistines, and it goes on to say here that he literally, his hand, it says in the NIV, that his hand was so tired it froze to his sword. 
You know, I wonder sometimes if we have the ability to focus our lives enough to fight the battle that strong, to fight a battle that consistent, to empty ourselves of all that we have. I love the fact that Eleazar literally fought until he could fight no more. And he said, I, he fought so hard that the Bible says his, his hand froze to his sword. I wrote this down here. What will keep us focused in the battle? Listen, listen to what will keep you focused in the battle. The fight right in front of you will keep you focused in the battle. Fight that fight that's right in front of you and hold on tight to truth. Fight the battle that's right in front of you. Listen, God's not telling you to win every battle. He's not telling you to go fight every one. He's just simply saying, fight the next one. L listen, you want to win this battle. Stay focused on the one that God puts in front of you. Stay, stay focused. How, how in the world is God going to create capacity in you? Empty yourself on the battle that's right in front of you. You don't need to empty yourself and save yourself for tomorrow so you have strength to fight tomorrow. Just give it all today. God will give you the strength for tomorrow. Listen, I know God's doing something in the world. I know He is. I know that God didn't close His, his eyes. I know God didn't take a nap. I know God is on the throne. I know God is preparing and creating capacity in His church today. And He's using you and me to do that. You might feel like God's just taking a nap somewhere. You might feel like God just checked out and said, well, I hope they figure it out because I'm mad at them. That's not the God of the Bible. The, the God of the Bible says he loves us and he wants to use us. My question for you, church, is will we actually open our hearts long enough to say, God, prepare me for what you have next. Create capacity in me so I can receive the love you have to give the love you have. Listen, church, I love you. I know God wants to use us today. Well, will you just pray with me? Lord, I ask right now that you just say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, create capacity in me. Go ahead, just say it. Lord, create capacity in me. I give you my life. And I ask God that you would just give me the courage to walk out what you put in front of me with all that I am. In Jesus' name. Lord, we love you. Amen. God bless you today. I want to encourage you guys to be proactive rather than reactive in your walk with Christ. Pastor Lance's sermon is called For the Win. We are in the For the Win series. Do you feel like you're winning in Jesus? If you're blessed by the word, type hallelujah in the comment section down below. Church, I want to ask you two questions before we depart. Whether it be self-reflection or whether it be in your Zoom groups or maybe this week you're meeting in person, would you be intentional with reflecting on these questions? First, what did God speak to you in the message this week? Second question, what are you going to do about it? Church, before we go, I want to remind you that there are many ways to stay connected. You can access all of our information at our website at www.pugetsoundfoursquare.com or you can download the Church Center app or you can follow our social medias on Facebook or Instagram at Sound Foursquare. We love you, church. And if I can't see you next week at the church, I hope to see you next week online at 10 a.m. Take care, be safe, and see you next week.